الله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم Dear students, Assalamu alaikum. Welcome to our next lesson of today in which we are going to discuss Leaves of Grass by Walt Whitman. Dear students, as you know, it is a very long poem. Today, the lesson will be restricted to its preface and some introductory uh, remarks about Walt Whitman. I hope you will benefit from this lecture of today. Hello viewers, today we are going to learn about Walt Whitman and his preface to Leaves of Grass. Leaves of Grass is a compilation of poems written by Walt Whitman. The first edition of Leaves of Grass, which was a volume of 12 poems and a preface, was published in 1855, around the 4th of July. A preface is an introduction to a book written by the author stating its subject matter. Whitman continued to add poems to Leaves of Grass and subsequently several more editions of the book were published. The last edition was finished by him on his deathbed in 1892. However, it is interesting to note that Whitman included the preface only in the first edition of the book. Before we go on to a detailed study of the preface, we need to learn something about Walt Whitman and the period in which he wrote. Walt Whitman was among the first generation of Americans born in a free country. He was born on May 31, 1819 in Long Island, New York to a working class family. He was the second of nine children. His father had a strong sense of nationality. Whitman, who was born just 30 years after George Washington was sworn in as the first president of America, shared this sense of pride in an emerging nation. This is apparent in many of Whitman's works. This is why he is also known as the poet of democracy. This strong nationalistic feeling is especially prevalent in his preface to Leaves of Grass. At the age of 12, Whitman began to learn the printer's trade. This exposure sowed the seeds of his love for the written word. Whitman, also known as the American Bard, is undoubtedly one of the most influential of American poets. He is called the father of free verse, even though he was not the first to use it. Free verse, in its simplest definition, is verse which does not rhyme or have regular meter. Whitman's poems in Leaves of Grass are all in free verse. His preface to Leaves of Grass is an essay on poetic theory. His works depict a shift from transcendentalism in his earlier works to realism in his later ones. Whitman as a transcendentalist is strongly present in the preface to Leaves of Grass. So who were the transcendentalists? These were a generation of highly educated people led by the essayist Ralph Waldo Emerson, whose philosophical belief was that there is divinity in both nature and humanity, which is corrupted by the institute of society and politics. These scholars were attempting to break away from the traditions of European literature trying to create a uniquely American literature based on the belief that with political freedom there will also come individual freedom. They also thought that the time had come for Americans to achieve literary independence. So, they deliberately tried to write in styles that were starkly different from anything written in European languages. 
Whitman was greatly influenced by Emerson and when he wrote The United States Themselves Are the Greatest Poem, he was actually literally paraphrasing the words of Emerson, who had written in his essay, the poet, yet America is a poem in our eyes, its geography dazzles the imagination. Whitman also recognizes that if America is different from its European counterparts politically, it must distinguish itself from existing models of literature also. So, we see him using not only new diction, but also subject matter. We see in his works a merging of two strong emotions, his strong belief about the divine individual to be represented by the American poet and what he hopes for America as a symbol of freedom and equality. The strong sense of nationalistic pride that Whitman feels for his country is interwoven with his theory of poetry in the preface. The author expresses his admiration for America by stating that America itself is the greatest poem and that it is full of diverse activities and natural wonders. To Whitman, the diversity of people, geography, culture, belief and work in America all combine to create a great democratic nation. The poems in the first edition of Leaves of Grass celebrate the same ideas that are introduced in the preface. In the preface, Whitman speaks of the qualities of great poets and how they have the ability to influence people. He believes in a close relationship between the poet and the society in which he lives. He sees the role of the poet as the very spirit of the nation, and so he writes, the proof of a poet is that his country absorbs him as affectionately as he has absorbed it. The words, the United States themselves are essentially the greatest poet, reflect the belief that informs the poems in Leaves of Grass. Leaves of Grass was intended to be an American epic. And for that purpose, Whitman employed in it unrhymed cadence and free verse. Unrhymed cadence is built upon the rhythm of the speaking voice and refers to the subtle rise and fall in the natural flow and pause of everyday speech. The preface is written in the same style, and though it is written in prose format, many of the stylistic devices are the same as the ones Whitman used in Leaves of Grass. These include minimum use of the comma so that the lines have a continuous rhythm, use of compound words and ellipses for rhetorical pauses. Like his poems, this form of prose writing is also difficult to categorize. The preface is also written without the use of the first person narrative. This is because Whitman is talking for every American, not just himself. He wanted the rich, white, educated people to see it through the eyes of the people who make America the great country it is. This strict avoidance of the first person singular in the introduction is in stark contrast to the lack of restraint seen in the poems. This absence of I also serves to remind us throughout that the essay is about and not by the greatest poet. Whitman started the preface with the word America, saying that it does not negate its past because its history has had a hand in forming its present. America's past has served a purpose and it has learned from it. The past is seen as the corpse that is slowly borne out, which has left its legacy to the stalwart and well-shaped air. Whitman views America as the greatest poem, with its people having the fullest poetical nature. In doing so, Whitman establishes an irrevocable bond between the poet 
and the land to which he belongs. He writes of the abundance of nature and the rich blend of different races that unite as one nation. For nature, he uses the words largest and most stirring, and he speaks of teeming nation of nations, implying constant growth and change in a country of diverse natural resources and varied races. Whitman here writes of the common man, saying that the greatness of America is not represented only by its elite, like the executives or legislatures, nor its ambassadors or authors, but the common people also. He speaks of the greatness of the common man, describing their ability to accept others, their acceptance of anything new, their curiosity to learn, their sympathy for others, and their self-esteem. He exalts their strong emotions, their generosity, and their good temper. Whitman sees in them the sure symptom of manly tenderness and native elegance of soul. He stresses the message of equality when he writes of the president taking off his hat to them, not they to him. This is a reiteration of the equality of all men. To Whitman and the American poet, the slave or the Native American is not in any way inferior to the President of the United States. Throughout the 1855 preface, Whitman makes references to the abundance of land and its many resources. His deep appreciation of the beauty and diversity of America's natural resources is apparent in his descriptions. He evokes beautiful imagery with descriptions like forests coated with transparent ice and icicles hanging from the boughs and crackling in the wind. He also believes that these natural resources provide people with work and livelihood. Whitman goes on to say that it is not enough that there is abundance in nature. There should be a matching generosity in the souls of the citizens too. The implication here is that these resources are there for all to enjoy, not just the privileged few. Prosperity or material wealth should not be the ideal of any man, least of all the poet. At this point, Whitman also begins to define the American poet who is able to embrace both the old and the new. The common people and the poet are seen as one. The poet's spirit is not just in communion with nature, the rivers, forests, swamps and all else. His poetry encompasses all those who inhabit these places. The theme of the poet's poetry is the equality of all races and genders. The poet thus identifies not only with nature, but also with the common man who live of the land. The 1855 preface was written at a time when America was divided into free and slave states. During a time like this, Whitman boldly wrote of America as a country of equality where all are one, irrespective of the color of their skin, their gender, social status, or degree of affluence. At this time, when slavery was a crucial issue in America, Whitman reiterated that America is one nation with a multitude of people, and there are no differences between the plantation workers in the cotton fields and the slave owners. He speaks for the black slaves and embraces their beauty and perspectives on life. He admires their faith even though they were deprived of all rights and were treated like animals or property. He admires their faith and rights. They never give up believing and expecting and trusting. Whitman also speaks loudly and clearly of the value of not only the workmen, but also the work women. Women in America in those days had no voice and had limited rights. 
they were not able to vote, nor did they have the same opportunities that men had. Throughout this essay, Whitman asserts that women should be as equal as men and emphasizes this by frequently writing of both man and woman. He promotes his idea of valuing women in the workplace by using the term work women and writes of the perfect equality of the female with the male. Not only did he mention women with men, but he refers to them as free women. These abundant references to women tie into his philosophy of freedom for all people, not just the affluent white male. Hence we see that Whitman not only speaks of the enslaved and celebrates their outlook of life, he also speaks for the equal rights of women. He speaks for the innocence of the humble and the illiterate as well as for the mentally differently abled. In embracing all of them, he puts everyone on an equal footing. So, Whitman speaks not only to, but also for the American people. America, for Whitman, has the fullest poetic nature whose poets are the greatest because they are serene in nature, who speak of peace and enlighten the soul. They do not embody anything grotesque or eccentric. The American poet is the ultimate man who protects even as he judges. He does not concern himself with anything trivial, rather lends nobility and grandeur to any theme he writes of, however insignificant it may have been. In Whitman's opinion, the poet is the ultimate worker and thinker who can make every word he speaks draw blood and achieve great things by his words alone. Thus he writes that he, that is the poet, baffles the swiftest runners as he stands. Having spoken about America and its people and what a poet should be, Whitman tells us what makes good poetry. People who live in the outdoors have an appreciation of beauty and do not need the poet to help them to do that. What people need of the poet is to help them connect with their souls. It is for the poet to forge a path between reality and the souls of people. The quality of a good poem is not in the perfect rhyme scheme, it is in the soul of the poetry. Whitman insists that outward perfection alone cannot leave a lasting impression. The content is the most important part of a poem. The message of the poem is what makes good poetry. So, a poet who is more concerned with the perfection of his meters cannot be a good poet. A great poet is one whose poems are one with the people. Whitman then goes on to give specific instructions as to what makes a good poet. Love the earth, Whitman writes, and sun and animals. Despise riches, give alms to everyone that asks. Stand up for the stupid and crazy. Argue not concerning God. Go freely with powerful, uneducated persons. Examine all you have been told at school. Dismiss whatever insults your own soul, and your very flesh shall be a great poem. These are some of the qualities that are the very essence of poetry. Through these qualities, Whitman embraces a philosophy of national hope and unification founded on the assumption of a divine individual. This individual is the archetype, who is the ultimate poet, on whom Whitman rests his hopes to build a nation of equality and freedom for all. He goes on to expand on the characteristics of a great poet. He says that the greatest poet loves the universe in its entirety with an all-consuming passion. He does not allow mundane events to break his spirit, 
but rather these propel him to proceed further. Hence he writes, what balks or breaks others is fuel for his burning progress. Nothing can stop the poet because he is so sure in his love for the cosmos that nothing can jar him. Suffering and darkness cannot, death and fear cannot. And it is this absolute love for the cosmos which is perfect and beautiful in itself that gives birth to the poet's creativity. The greatness of a poet's work lies in the simplicity of his expression. Whitman writes that the ability to delve into one's intellect and articulate one's thoughts on all subject is neither very common nor very uncommon. It is the expression of true art when one is able to write effortlessly and with integrity and a true understanding of nature. In fact, a true poet is one who can experience and express nature itself and understand its soul. He is one who can portray reality as he sees it. The greatest of American poet is one who does not consider himself better or superior to the common man. Rather, he identifies with the masses. The American poet will be noted for his generosity and affection. He will be impartial and love all equally. Whitman lived in a time of new scientific discoveries and he tries to reconcile science and poetry in his poetic theory. In the preface, Whitman celebrates science and avers that the laws of nature which are based on revelations made by science would determine the laws of poetry. He writes of the anatomist, chemist, astronomer, geologist and the like and says of them that they are the lawgivers of the poets. Whitman warns the poet to have a more comprehensive understanding of the universe through science. For him, there is no conflict between science and mysticism. He believes that an understanding of science will bring the poet nearer to God. Whitman then goes on to speak about philosophy. Like science, this too looks upon the poet for its expression. He writes that the poet has to be honest in the depiction of men and women. It is for him to write about the continuity of life and man's quest for happiness. For the poet, the past, present and future become part of one universal truth. The poet finds greatness in the procreation of man wherein lies the continuity of life. So, Whitman writes that the master knows that nothing, for instance, is greater than to conceive children and bring them up well. In his preface, Whitman is mainly concerned with celebrating a freedom which is outside the bounds of external regulations. Political liberty is also seen by Whitman as essential to the greatness of the poet. He writes that they, that is the poet, are the voice and exposition of liberty. Hence, the poets carry the message of liberty to the people. But this freedom is more a metaphysical condition in humans which cannot be quelled or defeated. Hence, he writes, liberty relies upon itself, invites no one and knows no discouragement. To Whitman, writing about life as the poet perceives it is beautiful enough. There is no need for the poet to embellish the truth, to create romance. He writes, most works are beautiful without ornament. He celebrates the human form and says that any distortion of the original shape and form of the human body in any form of art is a violation. Only those embellishments are permitted which conform to the truth and so he says exaggerations will be revenged in human physiology. 
Great poets do not use deceits or lies. They write truthfully and Whitman says that there is a beauty in truth written by the poet for which all faults may be forgiven of him. Only the truth can emerge from the soul and connect with the soul of the people, for the soul cannot be fooled by lies. Every action that one takes in one's life has a consequence. Whitman says all that a person does or thinks is of consequence. Our actions are a result of earlier actions and as a result give rise to other deeds. But the soul remains true to itself throughout eternity and it is only the truth that satisfies the soul. The poet can foresee the future and is able to judge the actions of man through the ages. And that is why his work has a universal appeal and is timeless. Whitman introduces the idea of the poet as a divine individual who will in future preclude the need for priests. He can foresee a time when every man will be his own priest. And this new breed of poets will speak for all men and women. The English language has merged with American expressions and it has absorbed into it expressions from subtler and more elegant tongues to become the new language of freedom, justice, equality, faith and all else that America stands for. Whitman goes on to say that the literature of America should not only answer the need of American men and women, it should answer to the needs of other societies as well. It has to be impartial enough to serve the developed and the less developed. It should serve both the old and the young. In fact, it should be universal in its purpose. Whitman emphasizes a new form of poetry which alone will stand the test of time. He says that poems distilled from other poems will probably pass away. A great and energetic nation cannot be satisfied by anything which is not original and vital itself. Those who focus merely on surface beauty and have nothing new to offer will fade away into oblivion. America embraces everyone. It does not only appreciate the highly talented and the educated or the genius. It allows all others because America recognizes the qualities of each individual. It sees in each individual as having the capability to contribute to building a superb nation. The soul of the nation is one with the soul of its poets. The relationship of the poet with his nation and with the universe is one of mutual love. This idea informs Whitman's entire preface and he ends it with the words, the proof of a poet is that his country absorbs him as affectionately as he has absorbed it. In conclusion, we can say that Walt Whitman is very similar to Poe and Coleridge in that he is a mystic and transcendental in his theory of poetry. However, unlike either of them, Whitman in his poetic practice is a rebel. The 1855 preface to Leaves of Grass is more of a proclamation of what a poet should be than a critical essay. It is an impassioned outpouring of Whitman's core beliefs. He saw in the times in which he was living the opportunity that was there for the poet. The new age of democracy and the expansion of science demanded something different from the poet. He clearly outlined the characteristics that make a great poet. The poet has to be one with the universe of things. His soul must be free of all constraints. He must perceive divinity around him. And he must be able to appreciate the miracle of nature. The poet is seen 
as the prophet of his land and of the new age. The preface was so rich in emotion that some passages were later converted into verse. And this brings us to the end of today's session. Thank you. Thank you very much, dear students, for participating in today's lesson. See you soon, inshallah, in our next discussion. Till then, it is Allah Hafiz and goodbye.